Hello and welcome to the Indian Cultural Forum and News Click. A journalist of many years of experience, Manoj Mitta has written a new book called Caste Pride Battles for Equality in Hindu India. Today he joins us in the studio to discuss how he came upon this topic and what it says about caste battles and caste pride in today's India. Manoj Mitta, thank you very much for coming to the News Click studio to discuss this book of yours, which is extensively researched. It's hard to really know where to begin to ask you about it. But let's begin with the first chapter. You, you highlight this very crucial juncture in India's history where the British Crown after 1857 said that, well, we are going to let the Hindus run their own religious affairs without interference. What was the result of this declaration in the small state called Kerala today? Yeah, that's a good question. But it was not only uh, with regard to Hindus that they adopted this hands-off approach, it was also with regard to Muslims. Right. Because if you recall, there were issues about both communities that led to the Great Revolt of 1857, as a result of which uh, uh, there was this famous uh, Vic Queen Victoria's proclamation which among other things said that uh, we are, it, it was an undertaking that we shall not uh, interfere with your uh, religious affairs lest you again uh, feel uh, hurt uh, yes. or uh, believe that we are interfering with your religious matters. So that was um, somehow uh, mistranslated in Travancore to mean that uh, there was this old custom uh, which uh, forbade uh, um, lower caste women, uh, particularly those who belong to uh, Shanar or Nadar community, to cover their breasts. Uh, this was related to the fact that uh, unlike in the rest of the country, South uh, did not just have untouchability, but it also uh, had untouchability in an aggravated form called unapproachability. So it was important for upper caste people to know who were the people who were on the same street, who were approaching them. If they happened to be of lower caste, then they had no business to be on the same street. You know? okay. So they had to maintain a certain distance between, um, say, Nambudris and uh, Nadars. There was supposed to be this much distance. It was all laid down between Nayars who are less than Nambudris uh, the distance could be less between Nayars and, uh, say, Nadars. Uh, so there were uh, there were all these uh, clearly laid down, uh, you know, minimal distances that they all had to maintain. So now related to that was the fact that it was important for them to know, therefore, who that uh, person belonged to, mm -hmm. and if it was a woman, they needed to know, you know, whether it was uh, uh, of which caste, right? So that uh, you know determined whether they could interact with them whether they could be on the same street and so on and so forth so they were therefore particular that uh, there should be a physical uh, difference you know in their appearance right so we, lower caste women were not allowed to uh, either cover their breasts or if they covered at all it should not be in a manner that would be mistaken for upper caste women so uh, the upper caste women at the time were uh, accustomed to wearing what was known as uh, shoulder cloth or breast cloth. And uh, so it was very particular for them to ensure that uh, uh, Nadar women were not allowed to wear. And that is what led to uh, you know, a proclamation issued by the Travancore government. At the time, the Diwan was one Madhav Rao who was otherwise uh, hailed as a, a great administrator. That's right. Yeah, because of, uh, you know, what uh, the good work uh, he was supposed to have done in Travancore and uh, uh, Baroda later. You know, he was a, uh, somebody who was seen as an example of how an Indian administrator was uh, as capable as a colonial administrator to run the country, right? Now, that man, who otherwise had this reputation of being very progressive and so on, he was uh, complicit in this uh, decision taken at the instance of upper caste uh, that um, lower caste women 
should not be allowed. So, they used that Victoria's proclamation to um, revive that old restriction and said, henceforth, now we have been uh, empowered by Victoria's proclamation to ensure that uh, you don't uh, cover your breasts. And if anybody does that, uh, they would be punished. So, there was a proclamation to that effect. And when the uh, British uh, governor of uh, Madras came to know that, he took uh, objection to that mm -hmm. because Travancore was a tributary state of uh, the Madras uh, presidency. And um, he said that this couldn't have been uh, the intention of uh, Queen Victoria at all, that some members of her gender should be penalized, should be suffering like this uh, on account of uh, 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 policy of non-interference. Now, mm -hmm. non-interference cannot be taken as a license to uh, inflict uh, such uh, dehumanizing uh, uh, customs or to revive such customs. So that uh, led to a prolonged battle as a result of which, uh, because of uh, this very forceful intervention on the part of the uh, British governor of Madras, Travancore had to roll back uh, that very retrograde uh, measure and uh, allow um, you know, all women, including uh, these people. But it wasn't easy because even then they said, okay, you will be allowed to um, cover your breasts provided you don't do it in the style of uh, upper caste uh, right, women. Right. Because it was important for them. At the back of their, of their mind was this uh, notion of uh, unapproachability. So that is how they could ensure the enforcement of that unapproachability. So it was important for them to know who you, your caste was. So if you also wear... Uh, uh, breast cloth, then uh, you could be mistaken for Nair and then uh, that would lead to, you know... Uh, the notions of purity and pollution would yeah, come yeah, into exactly, play. Exactly. So, it is all interconnected. There is yeah. another uh, legal battle which was fought uh, in the past in India, which was that the difference in punishment which was given to someone from a non-elite caste yeah. as compared to someone from the elite caste, the uh, the uh, Brahmins of uh, Varanasi were for eight years, you mentioned in your book, uh, not uh, given... Not eight the, years, it was more than two decades. For two decades, all yeah. right, were given yeah. uh, an exemption from the death penalty, for, yeah. for example. Now, yeah. that was one form of it. The other was that you could be shackled in yeah. a certain way if you were a so-called Shudra. Yeah. So, you know, when you were researching your book mm. and you found these instances, mm. how much of leniency or leeway did you give to people of those times? Did you did you think that, well, this is an atrocity in our eyes today and this is inequality in our eyes today, but did people back in the day really see it that way? What was what the impression you gathered? See, it was um, the particular instance you are referring to is a corporal punishment that was imported from the West. It's the shackle. part of their uh, biblical... Uh, literature, it's part of even uh, Shakespearean literature, it's part of uh, English language too, it's about confinement in stocks and right. that is what led to this usage uh, called laughing stock. All right. right? So it's about uh, being uh, shackled to one block of wood which has uh, uh, holes meant for the uh, legs to be put in and you are put in a public place and uh, people can ridicule you, throw eggs at you and stuff like that. So that's how you are humiliated, uh, and it, which is part of that punishment. So they used it in the West typically against uh, the underclass. So in the case of India, um, the, the then uh, governor of uh, Madras, or he was going to become governor, he was first appointed chairman of a, a commission that was uh, formulating regulations for uh, Madras presidency, um, Thomas uh, Munro. Right. So, he went on to become governor soon after the enactment of this uh, regulation. So, he got it into his head to import that uh, particular form of punishment, that confinement in stocks, and he reserved it for lower caste. He actually uses that expression, lower caste. And remember, this was at a time when uh, castes were uh, yet to be sort of, uh, um, uh, sort of counted. You know, there was, no, survey. Uh, there was no survey yet. They had no idea yet how many castes existed and the gradations, uh, this notion of, uh, uh, you know, shudras and then atishudras, meaning 
people below that uh, varna system who were avarnas or uh, untouchables all those notions were still yet to be formed you know this was in 1816 yes and um, the first uh, caste census was in 1870 so it's we are still several decades away from that right so this kind of enumeration so at a time when their their notions were still very hazy they thought it fit to introduce something like this uh, so their you know rough and ready rule was uh, you can inflict this punishment on whoever it was not considered demeaning mm-hmm. suppose you are anyway seen as a member of a lower caste such a punishment uh, would not be uh, you know out of place in your case it's not demeaning yeah it's not demeaning to you because you are anyway belong to that uh, so they easily imbibed those notions because they could see that this is one way they could uh, become acceptable to the elite of uh, indians mm-hmm. the, particularly hindu elite because they were so accustomed to thinking in terms of these caste notions so you incorporate that in your administration so you get uh, these uh, Uh, the hindu elite on board and uh, empower them in this manner so this power of uh, inflicting uh, this particular differential uh, punishment. barbaric punishment the differential punishment based on caste was entrusted to village officers you know the village heads those are typically uh, i mean needless to say they are all uh, members of upper caste or dominant caste right so it was very Uh, a cozy arrangement between the um, colonial administrators and the hindu elite right so they were uh, uh, in collusion they were together uh, to rule this country you know it was mutually beneficial to them right and there were some people who were able to go to the courts later and say that look we were unfairly punished yeah. and one of those groups were the uh, those who were non elite caste members but they had come into some land or prosperity and the other was christians yeah and then there was also a case relating to a muslim all right so it was pointed out that uh, look uh, i mean this was the crude understanding those days so the court said uh, well this was supposed to be for lower caste mm-hmm. now this man was a muslim mm-hmm. and muslims uh, ruled uh, this country for so many centuries right. so he he couldn't possibly fit the description of a lower caste you can't uh, inflict this punishment on him because it would not be he this is this would be demeaning to him you know it's it's it should it should not be so i mean it's, it's something that should be uh, appropriate for his status this mm-hmm. kind of uh, a corporal punishment so people took status based on caste yeah uh, so these are all those, granted these are all those early signs you know uh, that's why i put it in this chapter called early codes that's right that even before uh, caste enumeration and the, even before there was a, a clear or sophisticated understanding of those the what ambedkar later called graded inequalities yes they they already had put in place uh, such measures and this particular form of punishment was in existence for a century and uh, it was only in the second decade of the 20th century that it was repealed and uh, um, i mean uh, what is remarkable is it was repealed at the instance of uh, indian legislators who had begun to be you know playing a prominent role in legislatures and administration by and by in stages uh, their representation increased and at that stage uh, uh, you know lower caste members were yet to uh, be a part of uh, the ruling uh, mechanism right. so it was left to some progressive uh, upper caste uh, members as it happened it was one narsimha year who was instrumental in uh, pushing the uh, colonial administration to repeal this form of uh, punishment which was by then in existence for about a century all right yeah. now that's what actually made me uh, you know when you highlight these incidents i always wonder why you have named your book hindu india caste pride battles for equality in hindu india because from all the incidents there are far too many to narrate or encapsulate in this interview but from all of this it seems like there was no hindu india there was a caste india when it came to the hindus and 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 there, this is all pre hindutva of the kind of politics we see today was there a hindu identity which seems to shine through through the court hearings were people conscious of being hindu okay let me separate the title from the subtitle all right the title was uh, 
obviously used in an ironic sense. It was to, I mean, I'm, uh, there is no suggestion that the caste is anything one should take pride in. Um, of course. But it was m meant to shift the gaze from the plight of uh, lower caste or marginalized caste, oppressed caste, to the attitudes and uh, dilemmas of uh, upper caste or dominant caste. So that's what the book attempts to show. Uh, that uh, caste is something that affected everybody in varying degrees and forms. Uh, it's not something that only um, concerns uh, untouchables or Dalits. As far as uh, the uh, subtitle is concerned, why do I say Hindu India? Yes. You are absolutely um, astute in pointing out that, you know, was there uh, in asking whether there was something known as Hindu India at the time. What comes through is, Yes, I mean, these were battles that were fought among Hindus. So, yes. to that extent, it was a, a Hindu issue. Right. Right? Because right. caste was something that originated and that uh, was uh, uh, thriving among Hindus because of uh, what was perceived as a, a religiously sanctioned custom. Right? And um, uh, it is also, what also comes through is that for many of these people, uh, you know, religion is uh, uh, something about which they have a very liberal attitude. You know, you there are no hard and fast rules about how you worship, who you worship, uh, you know, whether you go to a temple or not. Mm -hmm. There is, a, a, you know, freedom given to you in all such matters. But when it came to caste, it was non-negotiable. You know, you had to abide by caste rules and Caste is what had a coercive mechanism because there were these caste bodies through which penalties could be imposed, through which you could be ostracized, through which, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, coercive measures could be taken. But as far as religion is concerned, you know, there was, there, there, it is anyway said that, uh, you know, Hinduism uh, scores uh, 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 very well on the parameter of liberty. But when it comes to equality and uh, fraternity, they are often uh, uh, sorely deficient, despite uh, such, uh, you know, exclusion of that community from all, um, you know, kind of social interaction with them, right? If in spite of that you want to call them Hindus, the point is, they have one uh, a range of very peculiar disabilities, you know, that uh, marks them out as people who are particularly vulnerable, so you need to uh, put in place certain special measures. You Even before you think of any measures, you need to first study them, you need to collect data on them across the country to determine how many of them are there, uh, what kind of disabilities do they suffer, and what kind of uh, uh, safeguards can be put in place. All that study needs to be done. So, until that point, nobody thought it fit to address this issue at all because right. the justification uh, available to the Hindu elite was, oh, we are all engaged in the larger uh, battle of political emancipation. These social reform issues can be taken up uh, later after we achieve uh, uh, you know, political freedom. So this was how they were conveniently deferring this matter and it was left to uh, an unknown uh, Parsi legislator called... Uh, uh, Manikji Dada boy to raise it and uh, because there was such uh, opposition to uh, you know his attempt uh, to pass a resolution on uh, uh, depressed classes as they were called uh, the government uh, the colonial government persuaded him to not press for uh, voting on that he said you withdraw that but the substance of what you have said we will uh, act on that and uh, true to their word they took a range of measures for instance in Madras they put in place an office called uh, Protector of uh, Depressed Classes. And uh, for the first time, you know, the then governor of uh, Madras in 1919, uh, Willingdon, nominates on his own uh, a Dalit called M.C. Raja to the legislature. And this was a revolutionary step to take because, you know, suddenly overnight, yes. this man who belongs to a community that is derided, uh, looked down upon, not allowed to interact with you at all. He has to, as is the He's protocol, he has to be called an honorable uh, member. 
you know. Right. So that was those are the kind of revolutionary steps that were taken. If uh, I was to ask you, out of all the cast of characters you've unearthed and you know written more about, who impressed you the most? Who you think was most instrumental in raising the political consciousness among what were then known as the depressed classes? See, it's hard to choose any yes. one person because they've all contributed in different ways and building and, on each and, other and they are yeah they were building on each other's efforts and uh, they were faced with different situations at different in different regions and uh, there was a great deal of diversity in the way um, you know castes was practiced or untouchability was practiced so it's hard to single out any particular person but uh, my personal favorite is uh, Virayan because somehow uh, despite Madras Presidency being such a huge uh, battleground for uh, uh, you know caste equality, um, he never got his due. I mean, th there was a book that uh, talked about uh, uh, these very uh, assertive uh, legislators. You know, thanks to the initiative of uh, the British administration, they were in a position to raise a noise, uh, you know, raise questions, uh, push through some uh, resolutions. But the fact that some uh, one of them even succeeded in uh, getting right. an, an, a, a bill passed right. was something that escaped the notice of uh, um, our academy, academia. So it uh, was uh, a matter of uh, uh, you know satisfaction for me that uh, something uh, as important as this uh, you know I managed to uh, put on record. But otherwise, you know, there were. So many of course. Uh, other. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, today, to what extent would you say that our judiciary has a caste bias? See, as I began uh, by saying that uh, it was the uh, the discovery of this um, um, uh, what is called structural bias that made me uh, go into where the, it was coming from. You know, it made me go into this 200-year history of uh, various uh, legislative and uh, judicial battles for equality, right? So, where is it coming from? You know, these battles, uh, you know, remained inconclusive. For instance, when I cited the example of uh, intercaste marriage, when I said that suddenly the vehement opposition that uh, uh, Patel faced in 1918 how did it all disappear and how did it all, how did uh, uh, this man um, Thakur Das Bhargava's uh, bill uh, get passed unanimously? Does it mean that there was a change of heart? No, it was expediency. Right. It was not possible anymore for them to be so brazenly opposing something so basic. But I because would say... You know, the, it, yes. was, it would be very evident that they are being very um, casteist right. and uh, it's against the you know, those high values that they were espousing at that very time. You know, this was the time when uh, constitution and constituent assembly debates were going on. Right. And uh, just after that, in 1950, we formally uh, swore by, you know, a range of fundamental rights and so on and so forth. So, uh, that, uh, you know, led to this kind of a phase when there was a pretense of our being wedded to it. And uh, it took a while for... Uh, the pushback to materialize. As a result, what you see is, you know, it's, it's very comparable to what happened in US. You know, after abolition of uh, slavery in 1860s, it took a while for uh, a pushback from um, the white supremacists. It was when um, uh, southern states adopted uh, segregation laws, which are otherwise called Jim Crow laws. Right. So it was while enforcing these segregation laws, Suddenly, there was an escalation of violence against blacks. That's when you saw uh, caste uh, riots. That's when you saw lynchings. These kind of things never happened during those decades when uh, slavery was in force because it was legally permissible to oppress them. Right. Anybody who violated would be immediately swiftly dealt with. Right. Similarly, here in India, so long as untouchability was in force, there wasn't this kind of mass violence against untouchables. So what you, what, That's right, the, yeah. I mean, people like uh, Gandhi, Ambedkar, or even Nehru never saw this in their lifetime. The first ever 
instance of mass violence targeting Dalits took place in 1968 in a village called Kilvinmani in the Madras Presidency. And that set the template, you know, there were some 42 women and children who were burnt alive. And uh, the justice that was done or was purportedly done never dealt with questions about how did they all happen to be, you know, uh, together in one room. Together in one room. Uh, how were they not allowed to escape? How did they all die in one tiny room like that, right? Yeah. So those questions remain unanswered. And the High Court went on to acquit all the accused. And it went on to say that it is unreasonable to expect. Uh, uh, it's improbable that, uh, you know, well-heeled people who had cars would have... Uh, engaged in this kind of violence and so on and so forth. Right. So they gave a very classist and casteist judgment and acquitted them. So Kilwen Mani set a template for not just mass violence, but it also set a template for um, impunity, that bias you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So where was it coming from? These battles that were fought through these two centuries, they remain inconclusive. It's not as if there was a change of heart. Right. You know, so... That shows right. in the form of this bias. I get your point. In the, is it possible, uh, Manoj, I'm adding another last question. Uh, is it possible really to, whatever the political circumstances in India today or tomorrow, is it possible to think of a time when we have reversed all the gains made in the past? Can you think of going back to a time, no matter how wonderful some people might think it was, to when there were separate sets of rules and laws for one caste and the other caste? where uh, atrocities are... The, you're talking about that utopia of purity. That's right. That um, the it, upper caste could be absolutely... All the gains we made post-independence, yeah. for whatever reason, uh, can they be reversed? Can India go back to 1857 from where most of your uh, anecdotes begin? Yeah, I can see that uh, you are asking this question in jest, but uh, uh, there are uh, enough people in our society who suffer from this attitude, who That's right. have... Uh, a craving who have a nostalgia for uh, that uh, time when uh, uh, the lower castes knew their place and they would not uh, exceed their uh, limits and uh, who would uh, ensure that uh, the upper castes were uh, uh, successful in uh, maintaining their purity and women also right. ensured that uh, the... They knew their place. Yeah, they, that, that the purity of uh, that... Uh, lineage was maintained. I'm so asking so actually in a very different, in a slightly different way. Uh, mm. You have studied the legal uh, progress of India, in yeah. a sense, to where we are now. Mm. Are these changes, did these changes seem to you like they are permanent, like they are etched in stone in on our republic? Can we lose all these gains if you're not careful? Yeah, see, see you know, what is uh, put in a statute book is cannot uh, be a reality unless there is a change in attitude. Now, that's the big question. Is there really a change in attitude? When we don't even, you know, when there's so much of uh, uh, Brahminical attitudes that still go unchallenged, they um, can get away with the claim that uh, whatever uh, they did all these decades or centuries was in the best interest of the country. Now, the, the legislative and the judicial debates that, uh, you know, that took place since 19th century show that uh, Brahmins had taken the position that this, irrespective of what uh, scriptures, Hindu scriptures say, that in Kali Yuga there were only uh, two Varnas, that there were Brahmins who were pure and the rest of the Hindus were all Shudras, right. impure. Right. So they were trying to... Uh, you know, keep as much distance as possible between the tiny elite Brahmin section and the rest of the uh, Hindus who were all considered to be Shudras, the servile class, who were supposed to be steeped in Tamas. And they were the only ones who were Sattvic. So there was no question of any Rajasik. And the, mm -hmm. how did they come up with this claim? From Shivaji's days onwards, there is evidence of uh, Brahmins taking the position that... Uh, because of what was said in uh, a Purana that uh, uh, Parashurama, an avatar of Vishnu, had uh, exterminated all uh, uh, Kshatriyas for abusing their uh, caste privileges, uh, the position that uh, Brahmins took was that there were no Kshatriyas uh, and by extension even Vaishyas uh, still in existence because they had also, because of neglecting certain 
uh, rituals. Right. They had also reduced to shudra dham. This is a position taken this in court. This was a position taken in courts, in legislatures. This was what uh, Brahmins in all seriousness had argued. And the matter had to go all the way to uh, the Privy, Privy Council, Council in London, where a group of Rajputs from Bihar had to go and tell these, ask these white masters, these white judges, please tell us, this is the kind of evidence we have to show that we still exist. So please determine judicially whether we still exist or not. Or are these Brahmins right in saying that there are no Kshatriyas in existence anymore? Now this brings us to the irony of today, the Hindutva uh, rhetoric about how what we need today is valor, is uh, is is uh, intellectual Kshatriyas. Oh right, you know, right. And there was a time not too long ago when Brahmins were taking this position on the legal fora and uh, legislative fora that uh, there are no uh, you know kshatriyas in existence no vaishyas in existence there are only brahmins and shudras this was the position they took right from shivaji's days onwards even shivaji was not allowed to anoint himself as a chhatrapati why because brahmins of his kingdom said that you are just a, a shudra you can only be a king in fact but not by right ah, okay. so he had to resort to uh, a Brahmin all the way from Varanasi and uh, come up with some genealogy, some fancy and genealogy to Mevat, say uh, that he is uh, a descendant of Sisodias from Mevar. From, uh, yeah, yes. Rajputana. Who from, had escaped Parshuram's acts. And, yeah, who uh, yes. somehow escaped, who survived uh, uh, Parshurama's purges. Right. And uh, Shivaji, the great Maratha, had to claim that he is actually a descendant of uh, Rajputs from today's Rajasthan. And that is how he was finally anointed by this uh, Gaga Bhatt uh, Pandit from uh, Varanasi. You know, because uh, the Brahmins from his own kingdom were refusing to uh, confer that title on him. So right. that was the plight of a man who demonstrated uh, uh, the most uh, undeniable Kshatriya qualities. He was the greatest warrior of his time. He was considered a very far-sighted administrator. But none of those qualities, none of those guna and karma were considered good enough in Shivaji's case for him to be considered a Kshatriya. So look at the hypocrisy of all that. Look at the contradictions in all that. So we need to uh, confront uh, the truth of our history and uh, only then can you really address the problems in today's society, the fault lines of today's India. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Manoj, Thank and you. It was for my sharing pleasure. your insights. Thank you for having me.